But do not forget this one thing, <clears throat> dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So I guess it's that time of the year where you're officially legally allowed to listen and play Christian or Christmas music. Um, I personally don't have a Santa. I'm not a big music person um, myself. Um, however, I've heard that there's a great debate. I don't know. How many of you think you're allowed to play Christmas music before Thanksgiving? Okay, there's a few of you. After Thanksgiving, the majority rules. Um, <clears throat> Someone recorded in the minutes. Um, <laughs> I know many people look forward to this time of the year. Um, I know many people wait for it. I've shared before in the past that growing up, um, Christmas was one of my favorite times of the year because that's when my grandpa would come and visit us. And my grandpa would make a great trip out of, his, uh, out of it from Michigan. Um, he would take like a two and a half day journey, just flooring it, trying to make it all the way to Arizona um, to hang out with me and my family. Um, of course, because it's warmer here than it is there um, during this time of the year. But I remember I would sit in class in like the second or third grade and I wouldn't be able to pay attention like many of our students this time of the year. Amen, students? Amen. Um, <clears throat> and I remember I I was already struggled with school already growing up. I was like, I don't think I have ADD, but when I was a kid, for some reason, it looked like I did. And I would just tell everybody, I was like, my grandpa is coming. And they're like, so what? And I'm like, man, you guys are lame because you don't know him. If you knew him, you would like him. So then I would have to go and proceed to try to tell other people about him. I would, I would talk to the peers next to me. My grandpa is coming. Well, good for you, buddy. And it was the most exciting thing. My teachers would get upset with me because I had the incapability of completing something because because of this earnest expectation that was inside of me. I sometimes wonder, do we have that same earnest expectation with Jesus' second coming? We're so looking forward to seeing him. We so want to be with him that we can't help but go and tell it on the mountain so other people can hear about him. I think a big reason why it was a silent night when Jesus was born is not necessarily because... Um, because it wasn't a great event, I think it was part and partial because no one was really expecting this event. People had waited so long for this thing to take place that they grew tired of waiting for it. How many of you are willing to admit this morning that you are impatient? You are impatient. Yes, Tony, amen. Um, you are impatient. I am a very impatient person, and it's in my DNA. I don't know why. Um, I want to be on time to things. My mom raised me growing up. She was like, if you're not on time, you're late, Zachary. Or if you're not early, you're not on time. And if you're on time, you're late, um, which didn't make sense to me as a kid. Um, but I, I was just conditioned that way, so there's this impatience about me. I need to fix things. I need to work on things. I have this inability to just wait on things. And the promise of the Messiah was given so long ago in the book of Isaiah and many of these prophets who prophesied about him, who predicted him, who talked about him. But when his, when his coming finally came, no one was really expecting him because people had given up waiting on him. Had given up waiting on him. Um, <clears throat> you know, Recently, um, my, my grandpa, the one who I looked, always looked forward to seeing when I was growing up, he passed away. He actually passed away this year. And so um, I had the opportunity to go down there and kind of help with the memorial service and all that stuff. So I flew down to Michigan, and I was there with a bunch of my family, and uh, a family that I had never seen before. I had seen, this, I had seen some of these, my cousins, I guess, in Michigan from my dad's side of the family when I was younger. But when I visited them when I was younger, they would bully me. And now was a chance for redemption. <sighs> now we're much older. And uh, no, I still wouldn't mess with them. They scare me. Uh, much bigger and just better at everything. Um, so I, we went down to, I went down to Michigan um, about the beginning of this year, may, or school year, maybe about September. And uh, as I showed up, it was just weird, really weird. Um, part and parcel because probably no one was expecting me. Um, I showed up. 
I didn't, it was one of those awkward situations with extended family where it's like you kind of know them, but don't really know them. So it's like, how do you say hi to them? Do you hug them? Do you shake their hands? What do you do? Uh, and I'm already an awkward person as it is. So it was more painful for me. So I go down and I'm just kind of saying hi. And everyone's like staring at me like, who's this guy? I'm like, don't mind me. <laughs> I'm just kind of here. And uh, I'm kind of like, you know how it's been said, you know, every family has the black sheep of the family. It's awkward because, like, I've become, like, the white sheep of my family, if that means anything. So, like, everyone down in Michigan kind of knows me as, like, my dad brags about me to all his family. Like, my son's a pastor. He's doing great things. And he just loves the Lord. He is doing all sorts of things. And that part of my family in Michigan is not really into this Jesus Christian thing at all. So when I come, there's all these eyes that look on me like, ooh, pastor. I feel like I'm the black, black sheep of the family. And uh, when I was there— Um, I had the opportunity to share for his memorial service just a little bit, and it was interesting because for the very first time, I've never really talked about my grandpa to my family before, to really anybody before, and I got up and um, I shared, and I I shared a story about my, my grandpa that was super funny. So growing up, I sucked at everything athletically, and I am not athletic at all. It's unfortunate. Um, I think I have athleticness in me, but I have no coordination to do anything. For example, uh, one of our freshmen here at this academy um, during a one-on-one game with them um, beat me four times back-to-back in a game of basketball. Now, I kind of let him win, right? Um, But at the same time, I really didn't even let him win. Um, he just beat me every time. And I have no clue where I was going with that. Oh, yeah, my grandpa. Um, so, he, uh, so growing up, my dad, would try to, my dad would try to teach me how to ride a bike, and I hated it. I'm a really stubborn person, ask anybody. Super stubborn about the way things have to be. I'm very particular. And I, my dad would try to teach me how to ride my bike, but I would tell my dad, you're not teaching me right. To which my dad would be like, well, what is the right way to teach you? Um, I'm like, daddy, just get away. You don't know how to do this. I would try to help my, my, have my mom help me ride my bike, teach me how to ride my bike. Same thing. Mom, you really, you're not doing this the way I want to do this. So just back off, okay? Um, no, I wouldn't say that to my mom growing up. She'd beat me. Um, would never talk to her like that. And uh, so n- none of my family would ever teach me. Uh, they gave up on teaching me how to ride a bike, but then I would be annoying because I would complain to them about how I'm so bored because I don't know how to ride a bike. So it was this existential crisis that I had about in the third grade um, about bikes. So waiting upon my grandpa, when he finally showed up, I was like, dude, my grandpa's so smart. He's so wise. He knows everything. He's older than me. Maybe he, he can teach me how to ride a bike. So my grandpa and I went into my backyard of this desert landscape that had absolutely nothing in it, um, just weeds and rocks and dirts, uh, dirts, dirt. And we were back there, and so my grandpa helped me get on my bike, and for a while, he would just, I had this expectation, this hope, almost this, I don't know if it was a placebo effect, but this hope that once I get on my bike, my grandpa is gonna, it's just gonna work. I know it's gonna work. So I got on my bike, my grandpa was helping me, and then he's like, all right, Zachary, I'm going to start letting go of you, but I'm going to be right here with you. And it was one of those things where he started letting go of me, and I was riding. And I was like, Grandpa, I'm riding. It's working. And he's like, good. I'm like, how do I stop? He's like, you don't. You just keep going. And I was like, I, I don't want to fall. Then he's like, then you got to keep pedaling. So I'm like in the backyard. I'm like, what do I do? I've never turned before. And so like here I am turning, and eventually like I crash and fall. My grandpa's laughing. Like, you mean person, go back uh, where you came from. And um, I crashed, and my knee got scraped up. Now, I never got beat up this bad when I was a kid. For those of you who don't like graphic imagery, close your ears. Uh, but I look at my knee, and like, this is probably an exaggeration. I, like, I for sure deserve stitches. Like, you can still see the scar, like, on my knee. It's a big scar on my knee. Um, it was just like... Like, like, my knee was, like, decapitated. Like, it was just open for everything to see. And I've never seen, like, white flesh before. And I got freaked out. And I was like, flesh is supposed to be red, not white. And I was just started crying. And I was like, Grandpa, that's my bone. I can see my knee. It, it wasn't my bone at all. So my grandpa, like, took me inside. Um, 
tried to dress it, tried to wipe it off. And I was like, oh man, like this sucks. But my grandpa always had a phrase growing up that he repeated to everybody, which was, it could be worse. It could be worse. Grandpa, school sucks. Eh, it's all right. It could be worse. Grandpa, like my dad's mad at me. Eh, it could be worse. Um, so like here I am with my banged up knee and there's like blood running down my leg. And I'm like, grandpa, it hurts. And he's like, it could be worse. <laughs> And so he kind of like cleaned it out and uh, took care of me, and I never rode a bike since then. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I've been, I, I, I kind of like bikes now. So, um, but this eager expectation of being able to see my grandpa because I know he'd be able to do something for me. I know he would be there to help me. I knew he loved me. I enjoyed waiting for him because I knew the results of when I finally was with him. It was way outweighed the process of trying to be patient for him. I've been reading a little bit, and you can join me in the book of uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 10, and I'm going to kind of speedily go through 1 Samuel. Okay, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10. There's two characters in, uh, in the book of Samuel that I really uh, relate to um, with my impatience, and it's Saul. Um, Saul was this guy who didn't really have the best reputation around. Um, he didn't have a bad one. He just didn't really have one. He was just kind of like, meh. He was the guy you grew up with in school that... There was really nothing, I don't know, there was nothing amazing about him. Um, but God chose him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8, before God elects him as king, or establishes him as king, he has him, um, he has him to wait. Verse 8, he tells Saul, You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what it is you are to do. Before Saul even begins his ministry, God has him learn the process and the discipline of waiting. I don't think we appreciate patience and waiting like we used to. We have everything at our demand when we want it. We can look it up. If we have, I tell my students all the time, you don't even need me anymore. You can just Google everything. What use am I to you? One of my pet peeves, my students, anytime I give them a Bible assignment, give, I bought them Bibles, beautiful blue Bibles. They'll be like, Pastor Zach, can we use our phone for this Bible assignment? No, you have your Bibles. Um... This process of waiting, I've been listening to this book um, called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by this guy named John Mark Comer. Not a Seventh-day Adventist, Christian. Um, um, he's a cultural influencer in the Christian and the larger um, non-denominational circle. And he identifies our culture's obsession with not waiting, no patience, and constant hurry. He says that the way our brains have been rewired, they've been reprogrammed by our phones, our devices, it's, it's mind-blowing. He says, like, a goldfish, a goldfish has a longer attention span than a newer generation that's arising. They require more stimulation, more entertaining, because the way our devices are now reprogramming our thinking. We have an inability to appreciate waiting for something. But it's not just us. Saul had it too. They had it back then. It's not just, it's in our natures. At the tree, instead of waiting on the Lord, we ate from it and then said sorry later and now experience the consequences of it. We have an inability sometimes to wait for things. And so to begin Saul, uh, Saul's ministry, God has him um, begin the process of learning of what it means to wait on him. Turn to 1 Samuel 13. Flip a couple chapters over. There is this other seven-day waiting thing that I find interesting. 1 Samuel 13, looking at uh, verse 8. Um, we'll read these verses. It says, Then Saul waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? 
Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days you had given to me and that the Philistines had gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down to me at Gilgal. I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled to do this thing. Verse 13, Samuel says to him, Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Your incapability of waiting for this amount of time removes the capacity for you to be able to enjoy God's blessings for an extended period of time. Verse 14, but know this, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man who is after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. His inability to wait on God to deliver what he promised him kept him from experiencing all that God had laid out for him. Uh, there is this movie that came out in 2014. Um, I'm not a huge movie watcher. I don't really watch uh, too many movies. Um, but there's this movie that came out in 2014. I think I watched it on a plane ride back from a mission trip. It was one of those like 14, 12 hour flights that are really boring and annoying. And so I put on one of the movies and the movie was called The Imitation Game. And it's a movie based upon the life of Alan Turing, the guy who basically invented the computer. And during World War II, the movie goes on to, pr to explain how Alan Turing was coming up with this machine called the Enigma. And what it was supposed to do is decipher German code faster than people could do. So we had people on the other lines that were able to intercept German messaging uh, to kind of help stop the, the World War II and what the Nazis were doing. However, our people could not work faster to decode the codes, to learn the codes and decode them fast enough. So he thought of inventing this machine that could not only learn the different codes, but also, I guess, deconstruct it faster. And so the way it goes is, what's super fascinating, is people's, the government's inability to wait on him to finish this machine. No one had the patience for him to be able to complete this great thing. They got upset with him. They tried to fire him. They pulled financial support from him because they were tired of waiting on him. So many times they begin to doubt him. They actually, at one point, the world praised him as one of the greatest mathematicians or engineers to ever live. They thought he was a genius. But because of how long it took for him to complete this thing, they begin to doubt him. They questioned his character. And they begin to doubt that he was actually really doing something that would help him. Their inability to wait on him caused them to begin to question him. Well, finally, when he completed, he was able to infiltrate German, um, German um, I guess, information um, faster than anybody could. And that's what we attribute, a big part of that we attribute to um, our success um, in World, 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 War, War World II. Um, get a little tongue twisted there. But... He had the capacity to do it. It just took time for him to perfect it. Uh, one thing that's been super interesting to me that I've been trying to fill my time with, uh, Dean Mark talked about this, I think a couple Sabbaths ago, just like what we fill our minds with. And it's very easy for me when I go on a break or a home leave or anything, just to watch anything, to do anything. So I was like, what could I fill my mind with that'll be beneficial to me, okay? Uh, so I started listening to podcasts, guys. If you don't listen to podcasts, do it. It has changed my life. I've been texting everybody, listen to this podcast, listen to this podcast. It's amazing. So there's this guy named Malcolm Gladwell, and I've been listening to one of his podcasts called Revisionist History. And in there, he identifies in culture signs of genius. How in culture, we don't have necessarily an appreciation for genius until that genius has already been displayed. And after the fact of the matter, when we realize it, then we have more of an appreciation for it. Like people like Picasso and these types of artists and things like that. Maybe they weren't appreciated in the moment, but after some time, we appreciate it later. That hindsight kind of gives us perspective. There was someone who learned to appreciate 
what it meant to wait. Um, this was David. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. The Bible says that God anointed David to be king over Israel while Saul was still reigning. Multiple times, David could have taken the throne for himself. He could have killed Saul multiple times and took it for himself, but he waited. He would not touch him. He waited on it. And even though David was ready to assume the throne, he waited 15 years, 15 years in order to get the throne. Why? Because he wanted to wait for it. So the Bible says this in 2 Samuel chapter 5, when they elect him to be a leader. Verse 3. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David as king over Israel. At this time, David was 30 years old. He waited 15 years for this, which means 15 years before that, he was already ready for it, but he waited on it. When he began to reign, he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all of Israel and Judah. If you look in history, David's rule was seen as the golden age of Israel's history. He ruled 40 years. And what is more fascinating to me is Saul also, according to the Bible, ruled 40 years. But their reigns were completely different. One was occupied with the enemy around them. No rest, no growth. Saul distracted because he can't defeat the Philistines. He's tired of waiting on God to overcome him, so he begins to chase David. He gets jealous of him and wants to kill him. But David, in the process of waiting for him, learning what it means to wait on him, enters into a reign in Israel's history when other people can now enjoy what it means to have rest from the surrounding enemy. David learned to wait on him, and as a result of waiting in him and resting in God, other people learn to wait on him and experience the rest that comes with the process of just following him, just waiting on him. David wasn't in a rush to do anything. Uh, I thought to myself, who's one person in my life that I know is just patient, who waits, who works, who is simple, who doesn't complicate anything, but who is simple in the way they do everything? The first person that came to my mind, this is really interesting, is Mr. Bob Thacker. (laughs) Mr. Bob Thacker. Recently, um, Bob has become my wood supplier, okay? I call him, he's my personal dealer, he's my wood dealer. Um, He's got some good stuff. Um, It burns nice. Every time I call Mr. Bob Thacker, he always has time for me. He says, sure, Zach, you need some wood. When do you need it by? And he lays it out for me. And I thought to myself, man, when I see this guy around Thunderbird Academy, he works so patiently. I see him out there mowing the grass. I see him working on things. He lives so simply. It's almost like nothing bothers him. He's just enjoying Like life, there's no hurry to necessarily rush through something. It's this beautiful process of waiting and resting. Uh, One of the verses that come to my mind um, here in closing is Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verse 31, where it says, um, And those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall shall walk and not grow weary. And run and not faint. Those who wait on him. Now, what's interesting is when you grow impatient, then what can you begin to do to make sure that in your impatient, you don't become impulsive and ruin something that you could have been expecting? I think David revealed it. God revealed it in David. The Bible says that he delighted himself in the Lord. He was a man after God's own heart. He constantly was after God, not what God could do for him. He didn't just go to God like Saul, what can I get from him? He waited on him. He delighted in him. He enjoyed what it simply meant to follow him, not to just be blessed on him. He understood the simple fact that if I delight myself in him, I'm in no rush to accomplish anything. 
If God has established me as king over Israel, that means he will make me king over Israel. I'm not in a hurry to begin something because he delights himself in God. The Bible says he's able to enjoy what it means to wait on God. Turn to Psalm, um, Psalm 37 verse 4. I thought this was super fascinating. Psalm 37 verse 4. <clears throat> psalm 37 verse 4. This is a psalm of David. And I think David could say this um, because he experienced it. Psalm 37, looking at verses uh, 3 and 4. The Bible says that we are to trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land, feed on the faithfulness. Enjoy it. Verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Your blessing comes not from receiving something from him, but learning to delight in him. Enjoy the process of what it means to have a relationship with him, and it makes it that much easier to begin the, prom or to begin, begin the process of what it means to wait on him. You don't have to rush anything. You get to enjoy one of the most important things, which is a relationship with God, to delight yourself in him, to enjoy what it means to be in right relationship with him. Um, and Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11, it's all over. Um, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. After the 70 years, when you call upon me, then I will come to you, I will hear you, I will bless you when you pray to me. What God said, I got to turn to it, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, what, the promise that God gives to Israel in captivity to Babylon is to enjoy waiting on him. Enjoy what it means to have, um, enjoy what it means to have that relationship uh, with him. Jeremiah 29, I should have written this down somewhere. Um, somewhere in Jeremiah 29, he gives Israel the command to enjoy the land of Babylon. He says, their produce shall be your produce. Verse 5, Jeremiah 29. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat of them. Take wives, but get sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminish. Seek peace, this peace of the city where I have caused you to be captives, and pray to the Lord for it. For it is in its peace you also will have peace. That means in captivity, in your waiting, you can enjoy this thing. You don't have to just earnestly hope for it. Right now, in this moment, it can be as though you've experienced it. When Jesus says, I come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly, that's not him saying, one day you will get it. He's saying, right now, you can abundantly have it. And the reason why you grow so tired waiting for it is because you have not put in process what it takes to experience it. When we wait on him, that does not mean inactivity. I looked it up in the Greek. It's a verb. It's a present active verb. It means you're, as you're waiting, you are doing something. David didn't just wait to become king. He began the process of doing things that would eventually prepare him when he was king. It was an active waiting. It was something different. Um, in closing, you can turn to 1 Peter, uh, or 2 Peter 3, 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. Um, this waiting thing recently has just fascinated me. Because I have the type of personality where I'm constantly going, wanting to do bigger and better things. But I think God assures me that the most important thing is that we enjoy the process of waiting. In Matthew 24, as Jesus is talking about last day events, he says that people in those days, if the master of the house would have known at what time the Son of Man was coming, he would have wished that he would have been ready. He would have wished that he was actively watching and waiting. Instead of not doing anything, he would have wished when he comes again, the Son of Man, that he would have been ready for him, that he would have prepared himself to receive him. So Second Peter, I think, kind of depicts the reason why we're... It's not that, it's like this waiting game. It's not just that we're waiting on him. Second Peter 3, verse 8. The Bible tells us that he's also waiting on us. 2 Peter 3, 8 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some of you count slackness, 
but he has long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Another word for long suffering in the Greek that's similar is he's patiently waiting. What if we're not the ones just waiting on God? What if God is also the one who is waiting on us for us to come to him, for us to begin that process of what it means to delight ourselves in him so that way we can begin to receive in the process all that is ours as we earnestly and expectedly wait on him. Let us not be like those people in the first coming. Almost no one was there to greet him because people grew tired of expecting him. They grew tired of waiting for him because they missed out on the blessings that they had and the process of waiting for him.